Uh, good evening. My name's Stuart Murdoch. I'm not the Lord Provost, and it would normally be the Lord Provost that would be standing here tonight. But our Lord Provost is in Alexandria on Twin City duties. So he sent along a small-scale replica to, to, to cover the introductions. Um, so my day job is Director for Leisure and Culture in the city. And it's my privilege to, to welcome you here tonight to this lecture. The partnership between Dundee University and Dundee City Council is long-standing. And this event tonight is one of the lectures that the city is very pleased to sponsor. But the partnership goes much more broadly than that. And I think you all know the significance of the partnership in terms of the town and gown relationship that we have. It's quite clear that in Dundee, the university is of real significance economically and educationally. What's less clear and what's less well known is how important the university has been, I think, to the cultural regeneration of Dundee. And I think this lecture series and tonight's event is, is testament to that. But it goes much further than that. Uh, the announcement on Monday, uh, I don't know how many of you saw it, that Dundee was going to join this elite club of cities of, of culture, a uh, uh, city of design and uh, recognition by UNESCO. That wouldn't have happened, I'm quite clear about that, if it hadn't been for the partnership with this institution. The recognition of Dundee as a city of design goes back to what Dundee has achieved over many years. And if you think about it in terms of the industrial innovation that took place in Dundee, uh, the architecture that is, exists and has been trained for and that has been researched in, in this institution and the city, the scientific in invention uh, and innovation, the biomedical research that Dundee is known for, of course, its computer games place in the world, uh, print and urban regeneration. All of these things, historically, have helped us to make a claim. And today, uh, design is very much part of this institution. It's redesigning itself. The city is redesigning itself. And of course, looking forward, Dundee City and Dundee University have huge design ambitions, uh, not least the Museum uh, of, of Design, the V&A, coming to Dundee. So it's, it's great to be here, and it's great to acknowledge the strength of the partnership between the University of Dundee and the city of Dundee. Um, I think it just falls to me to, to welcome you all and, and to apologize again on behalf of Lord Provost Bob Duncan for being unable to be here. He sends you his Christmas greetings from the other side of the Atlantic. I think it's colder actually there than it is here, and that might be something that's coming our way, just judging by what it felt like outside tonight. So would you please welcome our, our guest tonight? And I'm going to ask um, Pete Downs, the principal of the university, to make a formal welcome. Uh, but on behalf of um, the city, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you, Stuart. And uh, let me just echo um, those words. The, um, the relationship with the city is tremendously important uh, to the university. And as I look around at other universities and, and, and other parts of the country, uh, I, I see um, just how remarkable um, the strength of that relationship is here in Dundee um, with, the, with the city, with the people of, of the city, uh, and with um, everything that the city stands for. I think they, the notion um, uh, that the city is pulling itself up by the bootstraps is one thing we were talking about to, uh, this evening in terms of the um, uh, this uh, um, uh, city of, of design um, uh, um, recognition uh, and look at the cities we're now alongside um, in, that, um, uh, in that distinction. Um, it, is, it is fantastic. We, 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 I don't know how many Dundees we get into Beijing, but uh, there will be quite a few if anybody's ever been there. Um, it, it's pretty amazing, but, um, but Beijing are now asking us uh, uh, about um, uh, you know, what, what, what we think uh, should be happening um, uh, uh, amongst the cities. Um, that have this, uh, this, um, this distinction. So that's really fantastic. Now, um, the history of this lecture um, actually does not go back that long. It goes back to 2007, uh, because we inaugurated it then uh, to mark um, this university's 40th anniversary. We have many anniversaries. Of course, we go back to 1883. But um, uh, for much of our history, I don't know why that went off. For much of our history, um, we were part of the University of St. Andrews. Uh, and in um, 1967, uh, we became uh, independent from St. Andrews. And hence, 2007 was our 40th anniversary. 
And of course, that also means that 2017 will be our 50th anniversary, a very special uh, time for the university. Past speakers um, at this lecture include Kate Aidy, former president of, of Ireland, Mary Robinson, uh, and Professor Steve Jones, the, the, the physiologist. Um, uh, so no pressure for tonight's speaker whatsoever. Uh, but I don't believe um, uh, there will be any, any pressure at all because we're going to have a, a fantastic, I think, um, an interesting uh, lecture from Dr. Irving uh, Finkel, who is the assistant keeper at the British Museum. Um, because Dr. Finkel is the curator in charge of cuneiform inscriptions on tablets of clay from ancient Mesopotamia, of which the Middle East Department has the largest collection, some 130,000 uh, pieces. Uh, and I can say uh, that in our, um, uh, in our book of inscriptions, uh, uh, that all visitors, all special visitors and lecturers at the university sign, uh, we now have the first cuneiform uh, inscription, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so thank you uh, for that. Um, Dr. Finkel uh, specializes in ancient Mesopotamian uh, medicine, literature, religion, and the history of ideas uh, in that part of the world. Um, <clears throat> His other um, interest is the history of board games uh, throughout the world, and especially the preservation of traditional board games in many non-Western societies. But it was his work on cuneiform tablets that led to the story he's going to tell us uh, this evening in uh, this year's Christmas lecture. Because one day uh, in 1985, a member of the public walked into the British Museum with an ancient Babylonian clay tablet the size of a mobile phone. And Dr. Finkel realized immediately that it was going to be of enormous significance. Uh, but it took him um, a long time, some uh, 24 years, um, from what I can tell from the notes I have in front of me, um, uh, to persuade uh, that gentleman uh, uh, to leave the tablet um, with him at the British Museum in order to decipher it. Uh, and he determined that it dates from around 1850 uh, BC. <coughs> And it's a copy of the Babylonian story of the flood, revealing, among other things, detailed instructions for building an ark, which it turns out was round like a coracle. <laughs> but um, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> and that's really just a taster of what you're going to hear uh, this evening. Uh, 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 because, of course, um, uh, one thing that uh, Irving did was to, to build an, uh, the ark himself. Uh, and that was turned into a BBC documentary. So without further ado, and without giving anything else away, uh, can I ask uh, Irving Finkel to give this year's Christmas lecture? Thank you. Fantastic. Right. <clears throat> well, as the month of November gradually unrolls, um, beefy blokes driving lorries often wind down their window and shout, Santa, at me, <laughs> apparently as an insult. And uh, the other day, I got off the bus to work, and there was a small boy, aged about five, walking along with his mother, and he said, Oh, look, there's Father Christmas, and she pulled him on, and I accelerated to overtake them, and I stopped in front of them, and I said, Hmm, young man, I have to ask you a question. Have you been a good boy this year? <laughs> and this kid went white, and he, he held on to his mother's leg, and she pulled him away from me up the street, and she said, I told you you had to behave. <laughs> and I don't know which one of them believed what. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to um, fill in a few details left by our chairman unremarked on. Um, <laughs> about this. Um, it's absolutely true that um, this happened. A chap came into the museum with a cuneiform tablet. Now, when you work in the museum, one of the interesting things, if you're a curator, is you are on duty. And being on duty involves this. You have to sit at a desk when people come in to ask questions and pretend to be intelligent. There's a general misconception in the world that the museum is full of experts, and as a result, all sorts of miserable people come in with miserable questions and torment us all the time. <laughs> So, one afternoon, this person called Douglas Simmons came in with a bag of objects. It included this tablet, which is like, can you see anything here? Right. Uh, this tablet, 
um, which you see before you, and a few other things, uh, some shouty figures, some coins, and this, that, and the other. And when I saw this tablet, I could see straight away, as I'm sure you uh, can too, that it dates from about 1850, 1800 <laughs> BC. Um, it's from the shape, unmistakably, an old Babylonian letter. And letters are quite interesting because in Mesopotamia they believed in money and all the other important things like we do, and half of their correspondence is like this. Oh, I sent you the barley yesterday. I haven't received any gold from you. And then people write back, what a coincidence, because I sent the gold yesterday. And this check in the post phenomenon is nothing new at all. So you never know with these letters. They might be quite interesting. Sometimes they're about things like abortions and murder and really rather the fascinating. Anyway, I picked this tablet off the desk because it was the only tablet, and that's my job. I'm supposed to read cuneiform tablets. In fact, I read uh, the following Sumerian and Babylonian languages. They are the, uh, the main languages written on cuneiform tablets. The cuneiform script began before 3000 BC. It's the oldest writing system in the world. It's the most interesting writing system in the world. In fact, very few things are interesting in comparison with it. <laughs> and my job is to read these confounded things. And both languages have been dead since the first century AD. So they are altogether useless and the kind of thing the government considers a waste of money. So I pick up this tablet and I read the first four lines to myself because I had a good teacher. I'm not going to read the whole book, panic not. It begins like this. Wall, wall, read wall, read wall. Atrahasis, pay heed to my advice that you may live forever. Destroy your house, build a boat, spurn property and save life. Well, that is not what most letters begin with. And in point of fact, I realized straight away that this was, despite its appearance, a piece of real ancient literature. Now, the thing is, I better just see what the next slide is. Yes, I'm just going to go back. Sorry. You never know what they do here when you turn your back with these slides. Um, the thing is, all right, should I going to carry on? Stop interrupting myself. In 1872, there was a curator in the British Museum called George Smith you will see at a glance that he is characterized with a broad intellectual forehead, bright intelligent eyes, a fine manly figure, and this has always been the trustees' policy in the choice of their curator. <laughs> so 1872, George Smith, who was a self-trained seriologist of unbelievable ability, was sitting in the museum one day reading the tablet for the first time, which is on the right in that murky photograph. And his eye lit on the statement in the Assyrian dialect, written in the cuneiform script, that the ark landed on a mountain. And his eye slid down and saw that the hero released from a window a bird, and the bird came back, and released another bird from the window, and the bird came back, and when he released a third different bird, it didn't return, and so this equivalent of our Noah, as he obviously had to be, suddenly realized that the waters after the flood had gone down sufficiently that the bird could find somewhere to rest. So he's reading in the middle of the afternoon this inscription, and finds on what looks for all the world like a piece of Weetabix, an almost verbatim parallel to the description of Noah's flood in the book of Genesis. Now, you have to imagine how this must have been. In 1872, all Englishmen knew, and English ladies knew their Bible back to front, especially the first book. Everybody knew the story of Noah intimately, and it was completely unsuspected that this might turn up on one of these barbaric things which had arrived recently from Nineveh, where the trustees of the museum had been excavating. And Smith dropped the tablet on the table, which in fact has been frowned on as a technique ever since, and started to run around the room holding his head and making funny noises. And in fact, in the end, he started undressing himself. And the reason was that the unbelievable impact of this was so disturbing to him that he kind of went crazy. And that started something in the world which is very complicated, because when he made the announcement on the stage in front of the Prime Minister and the, um, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and all, in fact, it's the only time I think a British Prime Minister has ever heard a lecture on the seriology, there were many other worthy people in the audience. When the news broke and the Daily Telegraph first published it, there was a tremendous furore. Because what were people to do with this? What were they to do with this? And this manuscript, this one in front of you, dates for about 
700 BC, something like that. So it wasn't that far away from the period when people thought the Bible, if they ever thought about it, might have come started off. So there was a big problem, which came first, the Hebrew version or the Babylonian version, and what we were going to do with it, and how would we account for it. And this problem is so big that two things happened. Firstly, a lot of clergymen mot motored to the coast, stood looking over the cliff, and contemplated leaping off. This was one philosophical response. The other philosophical response was to sort out what it actually meant and how that had worked and how it had been that way. Most people have run away from it ever since. So I was well brought up as an Assyriologist by my teacher. I knew this text. So when I started to read this, I knew immediately that I had a text of that size. In fact, talking of small-scale replicas, I have one in my pocket. Just in case at the end of this miserable lecture nobody believes a word of me, if you want to check the readings, it's fine by me. This is not the real thing, it's only a replica, but it's here for consumption. So, I start reading this thing and I realise it's from a very historic moment in the history of the world, because in Babylonia the gods met in Parliament because they were fed up. They were fed up because the human race was very noisy. And Enlil, the chief god, obviously, had been in this position of having lunch, sitting in his deck chair and trying to doze, and all the rumpus from below of the human buzz and noise eventually goaded him to such a point that he put his foot down, and they had a meeting in Parliament, and it was agreed that all life on the earth would be obliterated by a flood, and then after that they'd invent something which was A, more industrious, and B, more quiet. So that was it. So there was a god called Enki who was very clever and had a sense of humour, and in the Babylonian story... He uh, opted, he made the decision to leak this information to a human being. So he, like God in the Bible, picked out one man in order to tell him what was going to happen. Now, the interesting thing is that this Noah, the equivalent of Noah, who we see on the tablet that came to the museum now, uh, already written down by 1800 BC or so, his name was Atrahasis. And Atrahasis means extremely wise. However, um, whatever his intelligence was, whatever his CV included, uh, he was no boat builder. And Enki, in this version of the story, unlike the other ones which have come to light since the one that George Smith first discovered, felt impelled to tell this chap everything he needed to know in order to build the ark to save life as described. Now, when Smith's tablet was first published... The whole narrative in the Assyrian version from the Assyrian library and the whole narrative in the book of Genesis were so parallel, they were so knitted together, that really one can hardly deny that it's a question of literary uh, dependency. It's hard to avoid this. And the one argument which people adduced in the 19th century and often ever since was that they couldn't be related, because we know what the ark's like in the Old Testament. It's a kind of coffin-shaped affair, long, narrow sides made of wood. It's easy to visualise it. And in Smith's tablet, the um ark looked like a cube. So all the um, well-established scholars say, well, I mean, you know, well, and all that kind of not, and they tried to dismiss the thing successfully. They weren't so good. This is a fruit of a lot of research, this illustration, for your benefit. I got it from Google Images. Um, actually, it's very interesting. We get a lot of letters from people in the museum saying, you know, I, I need some help. I've done a lot of work on this subject. I've investigated it. I've researched it. And that just means logging on and typing the word into Google. Some people don't even get as far as Wikipedia. Anyway, I thought I would just show you this. This is a, one of the many, many things available, what the, the, what, what the, um, the ark in the Bible looked like. So you have those two things. And of course, everybody really knows what Noah's ark looks like because it's a kind of watermelon affair with a little house and a ladder and a giraffe looking out the window. <laughs> so when I found myself presented with what was obviously a new and unpublished, unread, um, immaculate and virgin part of the flood story, I was full of inner glee and excitement because... For example, no German Assyriologist had even seen it. And this is a very interesting thing, because in the museum we used to keep everything under wraps, no one could see it unless they worked on the staff, and now everybody in the world can see it, and most of the people who come to think, see things are from Germany, and they're very good Assyriologists, and they're always looking for new stuff. And so this was marvellous, a new bit of the flood story that no rival had ever clapped eyes on.
That was very exciting. So I wanted to read it. And what happened was that this fellow, after I told him about the Ushabti figures and the coins and the lamps and the other things in this miserable bag, scooped them all into the bag, and off he went. Now, this was a time before the trustees of the museum published a monograph instructing staff how to fell people from behind <laughs> and <laughs> commandeer their property. And um, I hadn't read that then. Of course, now I would have immediately switched into that mode. But I couldn't do anything, so off he went. And I didn't see him as our chairman there for quite a long time. It wasn't quite a quarter of a century, but it was quite a long time. And in fact, I'd almost forgotten about it because I couldn't do anything. And among the 130,000 tablets that we own, there are quite a lot of interesting things to read. So it wasn't like there was nothing to do for 24 years, although <laughs> there are people in the British Museum who don't do anything for 24 years. So that's how it was. And then we had the exhibition about Babylon in London, and I was in there. It's my exhibition. I was the lead curator. And it's always a pleasant thing, if you do an exhibition, to go into the gallery and listen to what the public actually say. Because the design office and the people who do all those things and write the panels and write the labels have a conception of how to speak to the public and what interests the public. And it actually has nothing to do at all with the public. <laughs> so you find yourself listening to people saying, uh, I need to go to the toilet. About half the things people say in galleries are about the toilet and the shop. Or they can't read things and they have bifocals and it's too hot and I'm fed up with this and it's going to have tea. So that's what really happened. So I'm in the gallery spying on all this stuff and I see Douglas Simmons, the man who had the tablet, standing looking at a tablet in the exhibition. So I kind of sashed over to him in the most oily fashion. And the upshot of it was that he brought the tablet back and he entrusted it to my care for me to read it properly. Now, that moment transformed my life entirely. Because I discovered that Enki, who didn't trust Atrahas Caesar, as we have heard already, he told um, uh, the, the Noah figure that he should draw the design out on the ground and it should be a round boat. So among the candidates for ARC profile, with which we are all familiar, I don't think a round boat had often featured in high up in the list. In fact, it shocked me. I thought I'd misread the word. But then I started to think, because in fact, ancient Mesopotamia, what we call Iraq, is fed by two major rivers, and a good part of the, of the, of the commercial intercourse and the life and the interaction between villages and people is riverine. And when you have riverine communities, they have round boats that we call coracles, and which the Babylonians called a kupu, uh, which is related to guffa in Arabic, which is the modern Arabic word for the same boat. So, of course, once you twig that a round boat is a possible thing, all sorts of stuff falls into place. So, this is a photograph of a, a coracle from Iraq, um, dated in about 1920. And when I came to start deciphering the data on this tablet, it was extremely helpful, once I realized that it was a coracle we were talking about, to have photographs like this and also some published descriptions by ethnographers of how boats in funny parts of the world, as they thought of them, were being built, that there were descriptions of building a coracle and illustrations. And it turned out that the data in this tablet um, outlined a procedure of building which produced a craft which was identical to the ones which existed in Iraq until about 1950 AD. So when you realize this tablet's about 4,000 years old, you have people who live by the river making these simple craft in the same way for all that time. That's really quite an interesting matter. So you will see what these things look like. But of course, the coracle that was going to be built by Atrahasis was supposed to save all the life in the face of the deluge. So it had to be big. So, in fact, I brought with me this battered card. I can tell you some specific pieces of information. The base area of this coracle was 3,600 square meters. Okay, I don't know if anybody here has ever built a large coracle, but <laughs> if you're a bit shaky on the detail, if you had such a coracle and you lowered it from a helicopter onto a football pitch, the, it would stretch for at least half the pitch. So that's quite a big coracle. These domestic things that you see here are meant to shift a couple of goats or your mother-in-law from one side of the river to the other. Um, this was a different operation altogether. So we know from the tablet, Enki was explicit, 
uh, the size of it and the height of the walls, which were seven meters, and various other things. Now, the procedure explained from heaven to this chap wakes up one morning and all hell breaks out. I mean, his life is never the same again either. I mean, imagine it, you know, you get up in the morning, you have coffee, then you get a message from heaven. You've got 24 hours to save the universe. I mean, you know, it's a problem, problematical matter. And so the directions were crucial. And what Enki explained was that to make this circular boat, you lay out a circle of rope on the ground of the right diameter. And this rope is made from the pith of palm trees, which is twisted and twisted and twisted until it's very strong. And you lay it out in a circle. And as the circle comes back to the beginning, the next layer goes on top. And as you go round, it's stitched from north to south, so you end up with a big floppy basket made of rope. And once this has happened, you have to cut the ribs to fit the profile inside, and they come from the top lip inside the kind of um, the vessel, and they interlock to make the floor. And when you've got that, that is lashed to the basket, so you have some stability. And then finally, it's bituminized from head to foot. It's, it's waterproof with bitumen. So the thing is this. When Enki gave the, 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 um, the dimensions and the instructions, he told him how much rope he would need, how much wood he would need, how much bitumen he would need. In fact, there were several kinds of bitumen and what to mix in them. In other words, this tablet is like one of those things you get when you buy a box from Ikea. When it's printed on the outside, you know, you've bought a forcing hall's arc, or whatever they call it, <laughs> and then there's all this stuff. So you tick it off when you get home, of course, you find you haven't got all of it. But in point of fact, um, the information is astonishing. It is an astonishing thing because of this. All the figures make sense. So you imagine building a, a coracle, a primitive boat like a coracle, according to dimensions given by a god in 1800 BC, or written down in 1800 BC. All the measurements make sense. I will give you one lucid example. Enki says to uh, Atrahasis, you will need 14,420 sutu of rope. Yep. Nothing. Thanks. <laughs> well, it seems in this part of the world people don't do sutus at school anymore. Well, <laughs> the upshot of it is if you put it into our equivalent, and I hope you won't be offended if I put it this way, a very convenient way to express that distance is the following, London to Edinburgh. Okay, a piece of rope that goes from London to Edinburgh. Now, the thing is this. We have the height of the walls and the diameter of the object. And we know that the rope is a finger thick because it says in the tablet that the rope is a finger thick. So it struck me, if we have this data, we could have an interesting experiment that you could see, if you were going to do this, how much rope you would actually need. Well, I can't do that stuff to save my life. So I looked up um, Nobel Prize winning mathematicians in the yellow pages. I ran round till I got a cheap one, and the guy came over, and I said, look, this is the postulate, and I thought that was a very smart word. Um, you know, we've got this shape, we've got these dimensions. Um, if the ropes are finger thick, can you work out for me, in Babylonian Sutu, <laughs> how long it would be? And he did. And the result was so astonishing that he did it several times. We checked everything and everything and everything. So you remember, perhaps, that we had 14,430 sutu according to the gods. If you do it according to my friend Mark, you need 14,624 sutu. In other words, the difference between the number bestowed by heaven and the real number is less than 1%. And when you consider you have something as long as the distance between London and Edinburgh, this ain't no coincidence. So it is rather interesting, and in point of fact, to put it graphically, it's like going from Watford to Edinburgh, if that is helpful. <laughs> and it turned out that the quantities of bitumen and everything, they were all scientifically calculated, so that if they knew how to make a normal-sized coracle and they wanted to make one that size, all the figures were adjusted in proportion and correctly, so that in point of fact, it could be done. That's just a couple of um, 
sides. Uh, this is perhaps the last coracle made in Iraq today. The one underneath is interesting because it was a, a late submission for the Guinness Book of Records of how many adult men could be stuffed into a single coracle without it sinking, and I think this was the runner-up. And uh, the one I really like is the, uh, the one next to it, which is a couple of Edwardian ladies on tour who've been... Uh, manipulated by some slick operator into experiencing life in Iraq to the full and going on one of those inflatable-looking boats. And you can't really see here, but the original slide, or whatever it was, they are terrified, <laughs> not surprisingly. So I'm working on this, I'm working on this, and finding out interesting things for the once a month, not too much, dangerous, but not too dangerous. And what happens is this. You know Maeve Kennedy, who writes for The Guardian, I trust. Maeve Kennedy is a wonderful journalist um, who uh, loves the British Museum. Lots of journalists say they love the British Museum, but she really does. And she wrote, she actually phoned me up and said, oh, hi, Irv, it's Maeve. And I said, Maeve, it's Irv. It's a great exciting life in the British Museum. <laughs> and um, she says, anything, anything new in the, in the tablet business? And I, well, I said, I've got the prototype plans for the ark, you know, from about old Babylonian period, nothing fancy, just all the measurements, you know, I mean, if you want to come and have a look. So she came in and she wrote this article, which was published in the Guardian newspaper. It was just before Christmas. It was like this, that pre that natural pre-flurry of interest in arc matters as December warms up. So she, um, she wrote this, and two very interesting things happened which transformed my life in a big way. The first one was that there was a lot of stuff on the internet about why are we going to believe this monkey in the British Museum, and why, if he says this, should we believe him? And can that really be writing? And to hell with him. And quite a lot of people in the south of the country ganged up together and drank some stimulating hot chocolate and decided that I probably ought to be excommunicated. <laughs> well, as I'm Jewish, that didn't worry me too much. But <laughs> it's a point. So there was all that hate mail, and it made me decide never to Google myself again in the form of research, because you never know what was going to come up with people sticking pins. So that was that. But the other thing, which was more effective in a way, was this, that there was a cycle of people who rang up, also from America largely, saying, we, we got to do a documentary. Um, lots of them, and uh, perhaps a dozen or so. And the thing is, this useful instruction manual published by the trustees for the benefit of curators has a chapter on documentary films, and we are all told to sup with documentary makers with a long spoon, because we all know they're all damned liars. So, and they are especially damned liars when it concerns the Bible. And all of us have been burned by this procedure. For example, you might be called in to talk about something as an expert with all this knowledge and everything like that, and they record you in a flattering way, hanging on your every word, and when it's broadcast, they miss out things like the word not, for example, <laughs> and other such tricks. So we are on our guard. And I have to say, I dismiss these people in a cursory way until eventually a chap uh, called Dan Chambers, who ran a company called Blink Films, which used to be, he used to work for Channel 4, he rang me up, and he was a totally different kettle of fish. He was very intelligent, he could read on his own, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and he came in, and we had a talk about all this stuff. And as we were speaking, a really amazing idea came into my head. I said, Dan, I said, I know what we can do. We can make a documentary that tells the truth. And Dan went, hey, like this. No one has ever even proposed such an idea. What an amazing thought. Um, the reason I had this idea was this. You must know, like me, I hate this thing. You watch a, you watch a documentary on television, right? So they start off to say, I'm, we, in this program, we're going to tell you about something. Then they say, we're now telling you about something. Then they say, we've just told you about that. And now we're going to tell you about something else. But do you want to go and do a we? So you go and do a we, and you come back. Before you went to do a wee, we told you about that. Now we're going to tell you about this. And you go all the way through like this until at the end, and they say, well, unfortunately, in the Valley of the Kings, there weren't any papyri this year, but maybe next year there'll be some. That kind of nonsense. I hate this on television. I've often thrown things at the screen. So I said, we ain't going to do that. We're going to do something in the pursuit of truth. So that was one thing that happened which did happen, kind of. And the other thing was that Blink Film had this marvellous idea that they should be a book to go with a movie because it was going to take over the world. And they got me this marvellous thing with Hodder, who's the best publishers in the world, and I wrote a book with Hodder, which I'll tell you about very briefly at the end of the four-hour lecture. <laughs> so what did they do? What did they do? We decided the only thing you could possibly do was to build it. And 
Uh, this, this was a very alarming matter for me because I'd made this translation, I checked it every which way and up and down a hundred thousand times in case it was wrong, and I sent it off to this team of people, there are such people, who spend their lives reconstructing ancient boats on the basis of archaeological or textual evidence um, in a traditional style. And it's an amazing thing. They make Arab dows and all sorts of medieval boats. And there were three of these blokes. And they were, um, money was raised, I don't even know how. Um, I d certainly don't want to know how. And all those sort of things. And they got these blokes. And I had to send my translation, which looked like it had been typed on a laptop, which it had, across the world to be devoured by these technical geniuses. Well, these technical geniuses are people who really can count and think. And what they did is they put the data into a computer program which generated a kind of blue skeleton thing. And then they could press other buttons which would test the blue skeleton, which didn't actually exist, for certain practical things, like could it be. And when they'd done all this survey, they wrote back in a rather shameful way. I think actually um, the guy who was really in charge of it uh, nearly had a heart attack when, when he, he read the letter which explained that he was supposed to be building this boat which was so large. And, and he was in hospital for a couple of days until they brought him round. But once, once, once they did that and they started doing some research, the upshot of it was this, that A, um, they couldn't build it full size because the ribs were made of wood. And to have the ribs of such size, they'd have to be splinted and splinted and splinted, and the weight would not sustain itself. And the bitumen coating on the inside and out, which was so heavy, would mean it couldn't be built. So they discovered that, um, theoretically, you could not build this thing the size described in the mythological text. I think they were rather glad to be able to say that. Um, having got that one over on us, they then said that what they would do is they would build it to scale as large as they could using the dimensions so that it became, as it were, the baby brother of the original. And that way they could afford it and they can build it. So um, after a lot of uh, tremendously complicated negotiations, it was decided that they would build this replica on the basis of my translation in Kerala, in a boatyard um, in India, which was right on the edge of a lake, which was not dangerously deep. And which was sh sh sheltered from outside view by vines and trees and everything. So no one could see what was going on, even from a satellite. And they got this fantastic team of chaps. They'd all worked together, the three uh, designers and the, the teams they had. They'd all worked together many times, so they were on fantastically harmonious terms. And they started the work. So they wrote back and said, look, the first thing is we can't possibly make the basket and then put the ribs in, because how can you have a basket that's, you know, it would, it, would, it would be suffocated when it fell in on us and stuff like that. So what they wanted to do was to make the ribs first and then put the basket round it. And I thought, it's fine by me. So actually, I was in a real state of panic because I think 40 workmen, millions of dollars. I'm sitting at my desk in the British Museum with this thing in front of me, and all these guys under the hot Indian sun are building this thing following faithfully my instructions. And I used to wake up in the night thinking... God, maybe, maybe it's in Hittite and not in Babylonian. <laughs> or maybe it's a design for a London bus. And what have I done? And what have I done? And all this. And I, my wife, Joanna, said, go to sleep. So I went to sleep. So anyway, they started it. And we agreed that they could do the basket job um, round the rib cage. And this shows some of the workmen who are just beginning the process. Having made the rope from the material, they're just beginning this Round, roundabout thing, which you will see here. Um, I mean, I, there are so many photographs of this, it's almost impossible to choose the right ones to show you, but it's a marvellous thing. It's a marvellous thing. In this picture, you can see, perhaps, um, that the floor is above this, this, this woven thing. So these big, strong beams are the floor, and they are the bottom of the ribs which have come down to meet to make the floor. And they started with this thing underneath it, so it would go along the bottom and up the sides and end up in the same way as, um, as, as before, as in the tablet. And they had a very good team. This is one of our best workers. In fact, I, I sent him a copy of the book, but I've had no response. So. <laughs> and the, the chaps who did all the, all, all the work, they only used um, ancient type tools. All the um, joints were made with rope. Um, they didn't have any electricity, any um, glue, or even blue tack. So it was an impeccable piece of work. It wasn't just making a prop for a film. It was a real experiment to see whether everything would work. And 
This is the best photograph I can show you of what it looked like inside. So here you can see um, the ribs along the floor and going up. And they went 360 degrees round like that. And once the floor was in position, they laid big rings of wood on top. And then on top of those were stanchions which supported the deck. Because a real coracle or a normal coracle doesn't have a deck at all. But of course, you had animals and people to worry about. And the tablet is explicit uh, that there were uh, two floors and uh, that the animals were downstairs and the human beings were upstairs and of course it had a roof because it wouldn't do much good if um, all the water came in so um, there was a roof that matched in profile in the tablet the, 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 the bottom of the vessel but they didn't build that because one of the um, one of the crew twigged early that if they made it like that no one could see inside and so they decided that was not a good policy so this um, I actually saw for myself um, because, you know, I have to say, um, I, I don't know if any of you have made ARC documentaries in your time, but the thing is, you know, I, wrote, I, I discovered all this stuff, and I thought to myself that um, I ought to make this film, really. Um, you know, I, I want to be a director and producer. I want to write the dialogue um, and the music, do the actual filming, and, in fact, I thought what I'd do is I'd make it, and then they could just check a few tweaks, stuff like that. Actually, what happened was, when they started making this film, they kept me locked out, and they wouldn't allow me to suggest anything. And I don't know why they felt it was an unwise policy, but they were very firm about it. And uh, when I went out to be in it, which I was in various places, I was sort of flown out to Jerusalem, and I did things like walking along with my keys in my pocket, or and then opening a door, and then meeting a German Assyriologist and saying hello, and then looking at something in a learned way and stuff, and then not, not, not doing what I really wanted to do, which was to run the whole show. So um, what happened was they built this thing for four months, and occasionally I got photographs like of the elephant. Um, and I didn't see this till I went out with Joanna, my wife, um, two days before the actual launch, when the thing was completely ready. So um, you know, they, they, they took me for lunch, what they call free lunches in the real world, of course. When I had one of these lunches, I would bring something up, like, what a good idea it might be if we tried this. It didn't work. Um, I, the reason I mention this is, you'll see in a moment, that when I wrote the book, um, uh, I had to think about a few practical things, because you know I'm not saying anything about whether I believe anything or not, but if you write a book and you make a film about this, you have to make the conceit in your mind, at least, that what you're doing is a practical, real thing, otherwise there isn't anything. So uh, you have to think, if there was an art, and it was like this, and it was going to work, where were the animals going to be? And I thought, look, in this thing in the base, you could have bamboos uh, all round like that between them, and the animals could live in privacy, and the heavy ones wouldn't lean on the little ones, and um, uh, what they did with the dung, I don't know. Just now, i tell you something about Noah's Ark. There's one question people really want to know, is what do they do with the dung? And especially in a place like this, no one's really prepared to ask the question. So I'm just telling you now, in the tablet, there's nothing about dumb. <laughs> okay? So the thing about this is, what is miraculous? It's hard to explain how miraculous it is, but this is a three-dimensional existing thing which blew out of this piece of rubbish. It is incredible that it should happen. And they did exactly what was described, and the result was functional and also very beautiful. Now, we know as good coracle makers that when everything is finished, you have to bitumenize the inside and out uh, to make sure the water doesn't come in. Now, in Iraq, bitumen bubbles out of the ground in various places as a free donation from heaven. It's probably the only, uh, the only advantage of living in Iraq you could ever come up with. And for millennia, people have used it for all the purposes for which it is most suitable. And waterproofing boats, of course, is the, the best one. So our plan was, if we were going to build this Babylonian boat according to this ancient Iraqi thing, we'd have to have Iraqi bitumen. And all sorts of efforts were made to get a tanker to fill up with bitumen and arrive so that they could splash it on and roll it down. But, unfortunately, it was impossible to get any petroleum 
or petroleum products, products out of Iraq because they are all categorised as national treasures, at least they were at that time. So when they were building and they got to the, the point when the bitumen was going to be crucial, they had to find it elsewhere. And here I would definitely give you a word of advice for the future. Don't do what they did, which was to uh, get bootleg bitumen in India. It's just not up to the job. I don't know what, <laughs> what they might tell you, but the trouble with that is it doesn't go hard, it falls off in lumps, and it's a diabolically inconvenient kind of bitumen. And these poor chaps who are kind of geniuses at this work, you can see the one in the front, he's like a chief bitumenizer, and his father and grandfather, probably back for a thousand generations, could do anything they want with bitumen, and you can see him looking at it in, a, in that tone, and I know what he means, because it was really crappy stuff. So that wasn't fair at all. Anyway, I was telling you about the deck. You can see in this picture, perhaps, firstly, that we left open some of the boards, um, so you could see down and the light could go through, and you can see um, on the left the, um, the tops of the ribs, which were then sealed off with a kind of special ropey thing, and in the middle there's this house. So this is the chap with the, in the front, Tom Vosmer. He's the grand old man of boat reconstruction. He lives in Australia. And Eric and uh, Alessandro are his kind of two genius assistants. And Alessandro lived there all the time, the four months of the, of the, of, of the build, and, and encouraged the men to, to, to do the, what they did. And because we had to have a house on top, because in the tablet, rather remarkably, it says that when the work is done, that you tie a house. And um, this means it obviously wasn't made of timber, but the, in the south of Iraq, in the marshes, up until uh, Saddam Hussein decided otherwise, the marsh Arabs used to build houses and boats and everything else out of reeds, sometimes uh, rooms like this, great cathedrals of reeds, and they could do anything with them. And uh, this little hut which they put on the boat is a kind of replica of a mudif, um, as they're called, these reed huts from the south of Iraq. So we, that seemed to us rather appropriate. Now, one of, the, um, one of the thorns in their flesh that I constituted was that I was always nagging them about animals. Because my view is quite simply this. You want to make a movie about Noah's Ark, you've got to have animals. I mean, it's just a matter of basic street credibility. And whenever I brought this up, they all moved away. And there was a very small amount of comeback, and they said things unsatisfactory like, well, we can't. Oh, hold on, there's a picture missing in this horrible thing. Oh, what a shame. Well, let me tell you what happened. I had, I had a marvellous photograph of two elephants uh, seen from behind, standing next to one another. And over one of these lunches, I made the following reasonable proposal, that what I would do is I would wear a sheet and sandals and let my hair down and take off my glasses, and I would uh, slap these rhinos on the buttock so they went into the ark. I thought that was a, a noble, selfless, a slightly risky thing, but I thought that's the least I could do. And they said no. And um, I was very annoyed, and I had this idea. You know, when we were kids, you could get all those little miniature Britain's animals. I thought, well, why don't we get a whole sort of snaky thing of animals, and you can photograph it with your wizard camera so they look big, and we could do something like that. That's marvellous. No. So then I thought, well, look, we're in India. What happens in India is that in Hindu cult, there are lots of festivals where marvellous things made of papier-mâché and painted all sorts of colours are created for a festival, and often they are put in water and they sink, which is what they're supposed to do. So I said, why don't we get some of these artists? You know, they know what tigers look like and lions look like and all that. So they can make all these animals in twos and paint them with eyes rolling and teeth and everything like that, and we can have them on the boat. If the boat sinks, that will be perfectly normal. If the boat doesn't, we can take all the animals off and we can go on a pilgrimage all around India and consider it a miracle. So I thought that was a perfectly good working scheme. No. <laughs> so there we were. Now, when I went out there for the launch with my uh, beloved wife, right at the last minute, something happened about that, and I shall tell you in a moment. Oh, dear, I seem to have made a silly mistake. How stupid. Well... I'll tell you what happened. 
In fact, I better tell you about what happened about this launch, because um, they, as I told you, kept me suppressed and in a darkened room all the time they were doing anything. And when it came to the very end, um, we were allowed out the day before the launch uh, to go to the site because they wanted to film me as, you know, the great brain behind it, of course, um, for part of this documentary. So uh, the producer said, OK, what's going to happen is this. You're going to go in a taxi to the, to the um, boatyard where we're building. And um, you get out the taxi, and I want you to walk down this muddy uh, lane, this leafy lane, into the clearing where you will see the boat finished on the edge for the first time. Okay. So we're going to film you, and I want shock, surprise, and amazement all over your face. <laughs> okay. Shock, surprise, and Okay, fine, fine. So I'm sitting in the taxi uh, early in the morning, I think, shit, what was it? Shock, what was it? Amazement? Heck, I can't remember. What was it? Shock? Ama I can't remember. Okay, I'll improvise it. I'll improvise it. So the thing is this, I'm walking along, and this is how it had to be. It had to be like walking across Russell Square on the way to the museum in a kind of insouciant way, thinking about the origins of the Second World War or some such problem, and not looking worried, you know, like this, and then pushing aside the things and seeing the boat. And all the time I'm thinking, what is it I'm supposed to do? What is it I'm supposed to do? And while I'm saying, what are the emotions and how do I, <laughs> how do, I do it? They had this thing like a tank with a lens and about nine blokes on it. And the lens was about approximately the diameter of this rubbish bin, focused on me, ready for the emotion. <laughs> okay. So this was a really stressful matter. And I tell you, being a movie star is not as easy as it looks. <laughs> So I'm doing this, and they're more, they're sort of doing that, and I'm walking in a whistly kind of way, knowing I've got like 12 steps, 11 steps, and I'm going to have to do this face. And I went through the leaves, and um, actually, this is not the best picture, but you can see what it looks like. When we got there, through the thing, there was this boat sitting on the edge of the lake, built out of this tablet, built from my instructions, a third of the size of the original, and it was incredibly beautiful, and it looked ancient. It looked ancient. It didn't look like it was something made for a film. It looked like a Bronze Age object. It looked like a boat, and it looked like a she. And it's interesting that boats in um, Babylon, the word for boat is, is um, a feminine word, like it is in many other places, and it was definitely a she, and this was the boat that um, had come out of this mad project. And it was right on the edge, and it was waiting to be... Um, to be launched. Now, I want to tell you something else about the animals. Now I think about it. I'm sorry to be so unprofessional, but, you know, travelling so far north, it's lack of oxygen and everything. <laughs> the way it was launched was this. You had, we had the boat. It was very heavy, and it couldn't be dragged because the bottom would be ripped out. So they got these guys with big rubber sausages, which were inflated underneath, and they kind of rolled it like that into the water. And just before, just before this crazy um, birth process um, swung into action, we were all standing about, and you have to imagine it like this, that the boat's, the boat's there where the door is, and in between, um, all the floor is made of squashy rugby pitch-type mud that you go like this when you walk on it. And then there was a girl with a camera focused on the art, because that was one angle of the launch that they wanted to get. That's perfectly straightforward. Well, there was a kind of interim moment, and then through the same muddy path in, in, among the leaves, two old men came, each holding on strings about a dozen goats. And it was like those people who walk dogs for a living. And they, they, they kind of came up, and they stood in the middle of this muddy place, and there were two um, poles driven into it, and one lot was tied up to one and one to the other. And as I looked at this, I realised what the producer had done. He'd thought rather cleverly of a cheap way of accomplishing this crucial matter about the animal. So what actually happened was, uh, his plan was, I should say, was that there will be two selected goats to stand side by side with the ark in the background, 
with the idea to the viewer on television on the sofa that the whole of creation was somehow over there behind <laughs> it. So it's a pretty mean way of doing things. It's definitely the cheap version, but I'm afraid he got his comeuppance because the two parties of goats started headbutting one another, <laughs> and then they turned to sexual intercourse. <laughs> and as a result, the old men had to be paid a very extortionate fee to get them off the set as far as possible. Um, so, I, I can't tell you all the things that happened. It's crazy. If you are interested, of course, there is this rather useful pocket-sized volume. Um, <laughs> I would just like to point out that for most domestic purposes, one in the car, one in the bathroom, and one anywhere else but the bedside table. You know what happens if you ever write a book? You have a book launch, people come and buy the book, and you don't hear anything. And it's really embarrassing because you think, oh, you, know, you know, come on. So eventually you ring them up for some pretext, that completely irrelevant thing, so that you can mention the book. And when you do this, when you do this, everybody in the world says, oh, it's on my bedside table. Everybody says that, it's on their bedside table. I don't know whether that's supposed to be a compliment or an insult. <laughs> I look at it this way, that if people who go to bed with one another have other things to do than read my book, I'm perfectly happy with that, but a bit disappointed. Anyway, I don't know why I mentioned that, but what I want to tell you... <laughs> I want, look, there is something very, very odd about this whole matter. This is the boat being towed along the river from the launch. Uh, to where it's going to be berthed, okay? And um, an ark in the water has no engine, it has no prow, it just drifts. And, of course, that's all the ark had to do in the Bible and so forth. It didn't have to go anywhere, it just had to float. And this one just floated. And, actually, it leaked a bit. And, in fact, it did leak a bit. And in the documentary, there was a completely unnecessary focus on that question of leak. I thought it was totally out of place. I mean, the whole thing was it was because of the bitumen, as I tried to explain in the first place. It was just crappy bitumen. And frankly, I said, frankly, has anybody ever been in a rowing boat with dry feet? No. So why would you expect this to apply to this boat and just leave off? And if this had been Iraqi bitumen, we could have gone to America with no problem. But as it was, we just went down the canal. <laughs> now, this was, this was what's called rush hour in Kerala, and um, these houseboats, what they do is they, um, they take tourists up and down the river, sometimes for a day or more, and in the evening when they're coming back, they're all in deck chairs drinking their seventh or eighth gin and tonic and really feeling relaxed. And as we went by, perhaps 30 or 40 of these boats, everybody jerked awake and everybody shouted out, there's Noah's Ark. Now, how annoying that was, you can't imagine. It's fucking infuriating, <laughs> because it's not Noah's Ark. It's a round boat, and we know what... <laughs> now, you see, what happens is, when you see it from the side, it looks exactly like that stupid thing in the nursery, isn't it? And it's got this profile, this little house, and all that kind of stuff. It's absolutely maddening. And I tried to sober up and think about it carefully, and there is a very interesting reflection here, which must be, I think, brought to mind. Look, this is what it looks like from above. Now, that is not like normal Noah's Ark, is it? I mean, no one would say that if they were drunk um, going past that boat. They wouldn't say, oh, look, there's Noah's Ark, would they? No, OK, they wouldn't. So I have this interesting thing. Firstly, this is what happened at the end of the filming day. We were all exhausted. I've had five children. I've been to the birth of all my five children. It was nothing in comparison to launching this boat. It was the most hair-raising thing, but we did it. And anyway, this is it being parked by the side of the river, and this is me doing the um, Nelson act that um, the last man off is the captain. So just thought I'd mention that. Anyway, <laughs> I'm only going to tell you another 28 things. Um, this is the first one. I don't know if you've ever looked at Bruegel um, paintings of the Tower of Babel. You know Bruegel and Co. did the Tower of Babel, so they must have been sick to death of it. It goes up like this. And the thing is, the only source they had was the Bible, was the description in Genesis. They all worked from that description, and they all brought it to life in the canvas with something in common between all of them. Now, in fact, the ziggurat, which was in Babylon, um, was a stepped building like that. So, in fact, what they painted is not mad. It's kind of something to do with the original, by some irony because we know what the Babylonian uh, temple tower looked like. Now, so you have this situation that painters who want to do paintings of things in the Bible, they've only got that as their source book. So why is it, if you look 
in the world of, of pictures of Noah's Ark. Why is it that hardly any painters do a long thing like that? And most of them do a vessel which looks a little bit watermelony, like sometimes with towers on each end, and sometimes this and sometimes that. But basically, no one paints the thing in the Bible. So why is it that the painters, who are both working from one resource only, which is the text of the Hebrew Bible, one is pure invention and the other is literally correct? It raises the interesting possibility that, in fact, uh, what they are doing is painting a round vessel from the side because you would never know in any of the paintings that that's what they were doing. So it struck me, as we were considering about whether or not we spent the money wisely, um, that that might be true, that, 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 that there might have been a lingering, persistent tradition that the art was a round boat, and they couldn't paint it in any other way than from the profile. So the reason that this looks exactly like a conventional Noah's Ark is for that reason. Now, I've got uh, one little thing to tell you. Um, when I arrived with my wife at this terribly tense moment, all, all the workmen, there were 40 of them or so, all the workmen were incredibly warm and friendly to me, uh, remarkably so. I mean, I'm used to being socially comfortable, but this was something noticeable even for me. And I, I was rather taken aback. And when the launch had gone off and everyone was feeling exhilarated, all of the workmen wanted to be photographed with me one by one. So it was one of these sort of thing like that, and then a thing like that. And it went on and on and on, and we all did it, and it was lots and lots of smiles and everything. When we were going home on the plane, I said to one of the film crew, I don't understand why those guys were so really friendly to me. What do you make of it? He said, oh, I'm not surprised at all, he said. They all thought you were descended from Noah. <laughs> brings me to the main thrust of my lecture. Um, you know, you might see, um, that's not the most daft claim that's ever been made about Noah's Ark, actually, but it's quite a good one. Now, in writing this book, I found out all sorts of interesting things, and this is one which I have to share with you. This is a map of the world, the oldest map of the world ever drawn, and it was drawn in Babylon in about 600 BC. And you can see um, from the computer-aided educational aid to the right, that the world is a circle. It's a, it's a, it's a round circle. So the Babylonians uh, conceived of the world as being round. I don't know whether they thought it was a ball, but they certainly thought it was round. And they had a pair of compasses which allowed them to draw two circuses, uh, circles, as you can see. Well, the land inside the circles is Mesopotamia. It's their native world. It's where they all lived. And the big blue line going north to south is the Euphrates River, and it's straddled by Babylon, and the waterways at the bottom are something to do with the Persian Gulf, and the circles which are inside are either city names or tribal names of phenomena, uh, pe peoples and so forth who lived in ancient Iraq. It's not a, a road map, but it's kind of okay, because they weren't really interested in that. They were interested in everything else. And the blue river that goes round it is described as the river of bitter water. So they had the idea that our world was surrounded by this great river of bitter water. And if you were brave or foolhardy and you sailed a boat across that river in one of eight directions, you came to an island which stuck out above the horizon like this, a jagged pointed island. And there are eight of these things on the very rim of the world. Now, we've had this map in the British Museum since uh, the late 1880s. And lots of people have looked at it because it's really very interesting. But no one's really understood it. Now, on the back, this is a really unappetizing photograph. Um, this is the back of this tablet. It's very delicate and frail. And it, in fact, exemplifies the basic truth that um, the more interesting a cuneiform tablet, the worse the condition it comes to us in. But um, there are eight sections with rulings in between. I don't know if you can see on the slide. And each of these sections describes what's on one of those mountains. Now, the thing is this. The, uh, wh where that yellow pointer goes 
it says in the Babylonian, if you go across the river or the distance, you come to the mountain where, and it says it's wooden dot, 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 there's a word that's not complete, are as thick as a parsectu. Now, a parsectu is not a normal measure, it's a volume measure. And it's quite strange to say something is thick as a volume measure. It's like saying thick as a barrel or something, rather than thick as two short planks. And um, obviously, this is a kind of idiom in Babylonian, some kind of expression that people knew without examining its meaning too closely. And the thing is, this was never attested in any other document at all, this expression until the tablet came into the British Museum, which I wrote the book about. Because in that tablet, Atram Harsis, doing what Enki told him to do, stands in front of him and says, I cut the ribs as thick as a par sick to. Like that. Right in the middle of the tablet, this same line. And so what that means is, 1,200 years or so after this tablet was written down, the man who made that map knew the story and he knew the quotation and he knew which of the mountains around the edge of the world was the mountain where, according to the Babylonians, their ark came to rest. You remember, I told you that Smith, right at the beginning, the first thing he saw was the idea of a mountain where the boat came to rest. This map, by the biggest irony possible, now shows us as it were, where the ark came to rest. So the question is, which one of these triangles is it? Now, I won't tell you the whole drama about it, but this Miss Horsley was a lady who was a volunteer and very helpful for us, and she found a little bit in the tablet boxes one day, and I realised it was one of these triangles. And when that was joined on, it made it possible to identify which ones on the back, which they were, because the same information was on that triangle as on the back of the tablet. So all of a sudden, this thing which floated about locked into position. And it turns out that the mountain where the Babylonian ark came to rest is this one where I've labelled where Atrahasis' ark came to rest. Now, this is where it gets really wonderful, because... Um, This triangle here is, is the one, and what, what the understanding has to be, that if you, like Odysseus, uh, Odysseus, cross this lethal waterway, and you land on the edge of this mountain, you climb up, you see, silhouetted against the sky, the ribs of this boat, which have been cut according to this great dimension, like the ribs of a camel, silhouetted against the sky. And the idea, obviously, was that the boat itself was eaten, but the frame of it was still there, and it was still there to be seen by this intrepid person. Now, what is rather interesting is this. Let's say we all go together one afternoon, and we find this, and we see the ark in that position. And when we've had enough, we come down, and we cross over this water in our boat, and we land back inside the rim of the known world where everybody lives. Now, in this map, the first territory that you meet when you come back from that mountain is called Urartu. And Urartu is the ancient name of Armenia. And we know that because the Assyrians were big enemies of theirs, and there are lots of texts which describe battles and all sorts of trouble with them. And Urartu is the ancient name of Armenia, modern Armenia. Now, this is where things liven up. In the Bible... In their version of the story, it says in the Hebrew that the boat uh, came to rest in the mountains of Ararat. And everybody seems to think, for some reason it's translated this way, that the boat came to rest on Mount Ararat. But it doesn't say that, it says in the mountains, plural, of Ararat. And it's like saying in English the difference between you go skiing in the Alps and skiing in the Alps. So it's nonsense. So, in other words, when the uh, story eventually, as it did, went from the Babylonian story, the old story, into the text of the Bible, the basic outline of the narrative was adopted, even to the point that the boat landed on a mountain, and the Judeans who received this story 
as it were. They wanted to know where was the mountain. And the Babylonians said, well, it's, it's beyond Urartu. It's miles, miles up by Urartu. And the Judeans and the scribes, the philosophers who did all that work, they'd never been anywhere near the place. As far as they were concerned, uh, it was just in those mountains. And in the Babylonian idea, it was far beyond Urartu, beyond the, the world where anybody can go. But in the Bible, that Hebrew expression refers to the mountains of Armenia. So, in other words, it doesn't refer to Mount Ararat, which is in Turkey. And you can buy newspapers or hear on the radio, perhaps three times a year, that some lunatic has found another ark, another Queen Elizabeth II, or whatever it is, flying over Mount Ararat in Turkey. And if you fly over Mount Ararat, you can see all kinds of boats for nothing because it's jagged, uh, black and white shapes. So, you know, if you've got a good imagination, you can have a speedboat, whatever you fancy. But the fact is, Leaving aside whether Noah and the ark existed, leaving all that aside, leaving everything aside, whatever happened, no ark ever landed on Mount Ararat, because Mount Ararat is a modern name. And we have had in the British Museum, since time immemorial, the oldest map in the world, which has on it the actual mountain where they thought their ark came to rest. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if I'm mic'd for sound. Can I get this on? Yeah. Um, follow that. I think it's a dangerous kind of vote of thanks to get involved with. We're, we're short for time, so I hope you'll forgive us. Oh, and, I just and, warmed and, up. And, well, what er do you mean we're short for time? Irvin's already answered most of the questions you wanted to ask anyway, including the one on... Uh, Guana, or whatever it was. So I'm just going to go straight to, to cutting, cutting to the vote of thanks. I mean, I think we have been well entertained tonight. A good lecture has educational qualities, and it certainly has entertainment, and we've had that in spades tonight. I hope you'll agree. Um, it, we, I, I love the fact the whole thing started with the random gift, somebody being generous walking into a museum. And with colleagues in this room, I have a responsibility for museums, and I share that kind of the joy of that kind of discovery. Uh, it you must can't have, have it, I'm sorry. It, it, no, it, 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 yeah. I see where you're going with this, but no. <laughs> uh, and I think it's, you know, we've all got those secrets, so that, I think that was a wonderful way to start. I think also the tenacity of the researcher. I, was it 25 years, 26 years later that you really got your hands on it? Well, I, I can't remember now, it's all a blur, yeah. because my, my, any, I can't remember anything in my life before this tablet arrived. I, I, I can understand that, um, but to, to the tenacity, not just to, to keep going, to keep it in mind, but then to actually translate it. And, and I think also I'm struck by the bravery of when you're, un, when you're unearthing something in a research sense, and it challenges the conventional wisdom in every sense. That's, first of all, a shock. Uh, it's an opportunity career-wise, I'm sure, but it's also, it takes a huge amount of bravery, in, including some sleepless nights, as you said, to actually persevere with that. Most people at that point write it up, get a paper and retire. Irvin is exceptional. How many people do you know that go an extra mile and actually decide to reconstruct it and to build it and to see if it can be brought to fruition? And I think that the story of the accident of its discovery, the analysis of the, the text, and then the, the actual uh, reconstruction of it is actually remarkable, and it's been very entertaining, not only in its whole narration, but in the way you delivered it. And actually, good... I think it's for sale. Um, is it? It, it's it... possible it might go in here. You'd have to, you'd have to lift the ceiling, but it could possibly... We have to think about it. You're actually stealing my thunder. I was going to ask you where it, <laughs> where, where, where it had ended up, because... It's still parked it's where still it was parked. parked before. It's rather embarrassing. Yeah. However, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to uh, give a small gift uh, in a bag which is made of a textile called jute. And I'll tell you more about that later. Done. It has a certain connection to this city. Oh. As you, and it has actually a certain connection to Kerala and the part of the world where your boat was oh, formed. Yes, yes, indeed. And yes, yes. there's more of a coincidence than I thought of when this was procured for you. That's so, marvellous. Uh, I want to give you that. A ship in a uh, bottle. A ship in a bottle, or a bottle in a... Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I want to ask you all to, to thank Dr. Irvin for what a fantastic... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.